Um, so now we're just going to discuss about like each other's lived experience um, in the UK. So for me, my lived experience is spent all my life <laughs> in the education system. And for me, like in primary school, when you're young, you don't see things like race and that when you're very, very young, because you're just doing whatever with your friends and you're just having a good time. But my primary school is very mixed, so I didn't have to see that living in, in Croydon. But when I went to high school, because Croydon doesn't have, it doesn't have um, a good status when it comes to high schools. My dad tried and he moved us to Sutton, which was like another borough outside. And the school that we went was a girl's school, but it was predominantly white. And that's when I saw my colour as a problem to the teachers. And it's like they won't directly say it's your face. It was implicitly applied that, you know, we've got our eyes on you. And it was until we got into like year eight and year nine, that's when I started to see colour as a problem to them. Because the way they treated us in terms of how we wore our hair, when we used to hang around each other, was different um, to how they treated our white peers. So when it was us in a big group, it was like dive um, disperse. You you're very intimidating, and but you see the other white our uh, other white peers and classmates. They'll be in big groups, but it's not a problem. And it's like they'll run and move as if there's a fight happening. It's like we're not doing anything. We're just here having fun, like you know, just enjoying our break time. But it also came into how they handled certain situations with us. With us. So if there was a if there was fights to break out, they would call. And there was not many black girls in my year or the year, year above below us or a year above, they would call us and interview us about what the, what occurred in the fight and every fight was always gang related. So for us it was like, why is it when it comes to us, it's something to do with gangs, but when it comes to the other students, it's just a normal argument, you know? And that's when I saw that, you know, there's actually something wrong there. Actually, my school is racist. <laughs> I remember pointing this out to my mom and dad, like something's wrong with my school. Like, why is it when we do something, it's a problem, but when everybody else does it, it's okay. Like, even with our hair, we weren't even allowed braids for, like, two years. You know, they banned coloured braids. It was a distraction, but the other girls could come in with brightly coloured hair. So I think that's the first time that I've ever experienced racism was in high school. And for me, it's very, very sad. And that's something I'm quite passionate about is decolonizing the, the education system from below. From It's like you come in with these big dreams to become something to become amazing to get your GCSE grades but you leave kind of broken and you leave because we've not really good experiences you've got quite a lot of stories and when you're retelling stories to people there's is you realize that the negatives um outshine the positives um that was really kind of my lived experience with um with racism in school but personally I've never had anyone do that to me personally but I've had like my dad being a bus driver I've had him people telling him to go back to his country and things like that. And the stories that he tells us when he comes back from work and it's like, wow. So, you know, it's, it's being 14 and hearing you living that in school and then your dad living that at work, it's like, wow. And that's when you knew like the UK, um, there were so many problems. And then the stop and searches with like friends that were male when, we, when I went to college, it was just really, really like different. and. I think it's affected me as well as um, a ger ger studying journalism because when you turn on the news, you tend to see black people in a negative light. We always as if we're the criminals or we're this and we're that. Nothing's ever positive. Like they always outshine the positive. And if we're trying to do something positive, for example, like Stormzy with his Cambridge um, scholarships, they look to turn it into a negative. So he's racist for paying for black youth to go to Cambridge. So it's just like, it's just nothing is ever good <laughs> you know and it's never we're never seen in a better light and i think that's the reason why i wanted to study journalism because i don't think they tell stories of the black community or even marginalized voices well so that's kind of my lived experience but mine really really did start in high school with education system and the way the teachers taught us and even studying not only just history because i feel like um decolonizing the curriculum should not only just be a history so as a subject it should be subject on a whole basis science maths English especially, um, geography, all the citizenship, those that we need to, we never saw anybody that was black. We didn't get taught about black politicians. We never read books about from black authors. We didn't know no black mathematicians. Anybody that was a scientist was always white or American. So it's like we, nobody had a really good representation of anybody that looked like them in any of those fields and any of those subjects, I think, which really had a really big effect for me because I really do like to write. 
poetry and I do like to write plays and that, but I didn't see anybody that was a black author. I didn't see anybody, you know, until I got into college. That's when I started reading black books from black authors. So it was really, really like, it did have a really bad effect on me because I never pursued writing. Because when I came to university, I did economics first and then I switched to journalism. So I wish that we, I wish that I, that we was taught about black authors. I wish that I had was taught about um, black British playwrights. Maybe then I would have maybe gone straight into writing at university and not discarded my writing because I didn't see anybody that, you know, looked like me. So that's kind of like my lived experience. So we're going to go over to Annette. And Annette, the first question is, um, Black History Month is a celebration of achievements and role models. So who has broken down the barriers and who has inspired you to get into academia and who inspires you? OK, then. Well, I think, um, yeah, it's been a lot of people and a lot of things that have inspired me um, to get into academia. Um, but I think I'd have to give most credit to my children because um, that was my motivation and my inspiration. I left school with no O-levels. I mean, you're too young to know about O-levels. But anyway, uh, Margaret will probably understand what we had CSEs, O-levels and A-levels when I was young. And um, I had CSEs, but just, I left school with really bad qualifications. And just to say, just to reiterate your experience at school. So, yeah, my school experience was um, secondary school was... Um, a completely you know 90 something percent white school and um, my white friends used to copy my work and come out with better grades and this is no lie because I've always been a bit conscientious I never always I didn't have the words yeah but I always knew something wasn't right and when I got to what you call year nine it used to be called the third year in secondary school um, I literally stuck my two fingers up at school and I didn't do anything for two years the last two years if my dad knew I wouldn't be alive now and that's the truth my dad was too busy being an activist for other black people's kids um that's another story but um but no it's the truth and i left school with uh, nothing i um had three children young and i went to uni um i went to university when i was 27 my children were very young three very young children but that was my motivation i was like hold on a minute you know i want my kids to go to uni and i felt like well i needed to set an example how can i say to my children there were three five and seven when i went how can i say to my kids to go to uni if i haven't and that was a hundred percent that was my motiv motivation. Um, I would also say that having been part of the, the Black Women's Organisation, a Saab, a Women's Centre that I've talked about before, that definitely was, was really important for me because up until I was 16, up until I left school, to be honest, my contact with Black people was not that much. So again, my dad was a Black activist, but my dad was quite a typical Caribbean, Jamaican parent, was very strict. You know, children should be not seen or heard so <laughs> unless I went out with him to places you know I didn't get to spend much time socializing with anybody black or white so um so when I I was 17 when I joined Asaba I was one of their first um their first members and being part of Asaba Women's Centre I got to meet lots of black women and black men um and you know I felt very empowered you know because it was a very empowering organization and institution and so at the same time like I said after a few years and after I you know I'd had my last child I decided to go to university and um yeah so I just feel like the, the Asaba and my children inspired me my dad I have to give some credit to my to both of my parents but my dad in particular my dad is a black activist if you ever I mean he just died recently a few months ago and um, but my dad was a very outspoken he spoke truth to power yeah to white power when he came here from the 1950s until he died yeah he never apologized he he did like I said I'm not going to take up this but he was on a lot of um board committees you know with the home office all sorts of things but my dad was a very straight speaking person and um and he did a lot of advocacy um for black people in coventry but also around the country so i'd have to give some credit to him but other other people and other things that have inspired me were again were i mean we hear about uh, people like malcolm x and martin luther king and people like that you know mary seacole but there were some other you know um Famous people that we don't, or people that maybe not are not so well known. So Marcus Garvey, I know Margaret mentioned Margaret, um, sorry, uh, Marcus Garvey earlier. Um, you know, Kwame the Kumra. You know, there's lots of people, Lado Equiano, yeah, that I've learned about. You know, and I could learn more. Um, you know, Harriet Tubman. These people, when I've heard their stories and learned their stories and learned that these black people, through you know, through the sacrifice and all the challenges that they were going through, you know, um, and racism that they were going through, and yet they still 
you know, overcame, you know, adversity. Yeah, people like that have definitely, definitely been, um, you know, role models and inspirations for me. And my dad, one thing that my dad always, I have to give credit to my dad. So whilst my dad was an activist and um, and doing lots of things out in the community, he always, um, my dad was a very proud black man, a very proud Jamaican. And yeah, he instilled that in us. Yeah, he was never embarrassed and I was never, we were never embarrassed or ashamed of being black. We loved being black. We loved being Jamaican. Um, yeah, and so I have to say that, you know, those are my kind of inspirations, yeah, in terms of, yeah, what you've asked. Okay, so have things changed since you started your career and what challenges do you think a young black person following in your footsteps will still face now? Things have changed, but not, not as much as I would like. I mean, based on the example you just gave, so again, when you just talked about your experience at school, it's the same as my children. So I have three adult children, they're older than you, um, they're all in their thirties, yeah. So, and my children went to a school in in Coventry. And um, interestingly, um, my children. I remember my daughter, uh, my middle daughter, coming home and saying exactly what you just said that she'd been, she'd got into trouble. There wasn't many black kids. There was only about two or three. <laughs> but th they were sitting together on a a, a a bench, and they were told that they were intimidating. Um, just sitting, grouping together, that they were intimidating. Um, you know, I, you know, and I had, you know, one or two occasions where I did have to go to the school and challenge the school um, based on what I felt stereotypes that they were, you know, uh, putting on my children. So um, I think that, you know, sorry, what was the question again? Sorry, I just kind of what was the well about young person. Yeah. So yeah. So I was, I, I, yeah. So in terms of young people, a young person. So um, I think what I would if, if I was giving them some advice um, in terms of, I think is, I think one is to be, is like I said, not to, you know, apologize, be themselves as much as you can, you know, be yourself, yeah, without apology, um, you know, take ownership of that. I think I would advise a black, you know, we talk about white allies, we hear lots of talk at the moment, I don't know if you've come across that term, white allies are good, yes, they have a place, whatever, but so do black allies, and I would say that, you know, as a black young person, you know, if, especially in education, if those role models and if those people aren't there for you in terms of the lecturers or your tutors, or whatever, supervisors, then source them out elsewhere, whether that's within the institution or outside of the institution, because, you know, the, you know, when you're telling them your stories or how you feel, the likelihood is they will be able, to, they're going to accept that and they're going to be able to empathise with it and perhaps give you advice. Whereas uh, my experience, and it sounds like some of your experience has been, when you tell people, you know, who, you know, who have not experienced that, you know, they think maybe, like I said, you've got a chip on your shoulder, you're imagining it, it's not as bad as you're saying. And then that just stops you from wanting to like, you know, share your experiences. Like I said, get, you know, get a message. So over to you, Margaret. So what has been your experience as a black woman in the field of law, the arts and academia, and generally in the UK society throughout your life? Okay. Uh, oh. I mean, to an extent, I've been very lucky, I think, because um, I come from uh, a, um, a background of professionals. And um, so I had um, a schooling that told me about the fact that, you know, for example, Alexander Dumas was a, a black man. Um, so, so I knew that. I had that there were historically there were writers. Um, um, my aunt Gladys was a writer. My uh, I mentioned my grandfather was a, was, a, was a, a, a writer. He was also a barrister and a politician. Uh, my uncle Archie was a politician. He was a, a member of Nkrumah's government immediately after independence, and so on. So to an extent, I think I was um, I, I, I was given some sort of confidence to be able to enter into the um, you enter into the professional world and then you find out that you're um, still subject to certain bizarre microaggressions and you will know that Alexandra Wilson went to the magistrate's court as a professional woman in her smart barrister's outfit um, and on the same day was asked, but 
by three different court officials to leave the courtroom because they thought that she was defendant and it wasn't the time yet for defendants to come in. And she was so upset about it that she tweeted about it. Um, I was really upset on her behalf because the sort of microaggressions that I uh, experienced when I was younger, I really sincerely hoped wouldn't be still um, being perpetrated these days. Um, and it was really a great disappointment to me to find out that the assumption is still that we're there to serve, um, you know, I, I, uh, or, or that we're there to steal. I mean, we all know what it's like being stalked by the um, store detective. And all I can do is say is thank God for online shopping. Um, in London, this is a great thing that happens in London. Um, we know what it's like to be bypassed by the black cab driver, you know, the black taxis, because they don't want to pick us up. And um, thank God they're going for Uber and um, uh uh, you know, so so life changes through through you know sort of technological advancement that doesn't discriminate in quite the same way. Although we do know that there are some AI difficulties you know, because, of course, you know, the people who program the algorithms are people who don't have our lived experience. So we we do know that the algorithms can work against us. Um, but um, what what I, what I found is that it's it's made me treat every slight as a spur to go on and do better and I do find that that works you know every time somebody um treats me as other or as lesser I just think okay I'll, I'll show you and you know it does it does work it does help it gives me an incredible boost um I can remember on one occasion um I was the keynote speaker asked to um and I walked into the um cloakroom area um and it, it, it's not a formalised cloakroom. They sort of have a, a, you know, rails, coat rails up. And, and uh, I'd hung my coat up and I was just sort of um, getting myself ready. And two women came in and they started to give me their coats. And I pointed to the rail and said, I hung the coat up. And they looked at me really you know, as if I was mad. And it was because they thought I was the coat check girl. And they didn't realise until, of course, we went into the room and, uh, you know, I was greeted by the people who were hosting the event. I was, in fact, the keynote speaker. And given that they were sit these two women were seated, in, like, seated at the front, it gave me great pleasure in delivering my speech. And I'm sure I gave it a better speech than I would have done um, <laughs> just because I really wanted to show them. So, you know, it, it is it's incredibly um, empowering at times. But um, I do I do understand um your points, the points that you've both made. Um, and my father used to say that if a job was worth doing, it was worth doing well. And my mother always used to say, um, if a crowd of people is uh, that place would be one that they see. And those are two things that really sort of um, were real um, spurs to me to always make sure not only that I was, uh, and my brothers are saying that we were doing our best and being our best, but also that we always also did everything with the utmost propriety because it, you know it's that, that you can see it with the way Obama has been criticised by the extreme right for everything that he's done, um, including the colour of suits that he wore when he wore a light brown suit because that was the the worst thing that they could think of when the current incumbent flouts every regulation, all manner of proprieties, but retains their support. And that tells you an enormous amount about the degree of privilege that he has from coming from his position um, of having white skin, which is something that, you know, it could be seen as the most incredible negative. But I think that it's an incredible positive to be seen to be the people that people expect to do, you know, to, to behave with maximum propriety. And that's where I see it. I'm going to see it like that because that's what gets me out of bed. We're the ones that everyone expects to behave well. But, but you know, it, it, it it's bad when they, when when it it becomes a problem for us because they they will um, as you know very often with the police hold us to a different standard and that and that, and and when that standard means that we begin to become endangered but it it does mean that and from my perspective again I would work with the system to try to understand the system who are the decision makers how do I get the decision makers to understand the issues what can we do to create change. Um, and I've been doing that within the arts. I've been doing that 
when I was in the law. Um, and it's, a, I suppose, um, uh, it was the ability to see members of my family as role models and in, in that sphere that helps enormously because of the writers, because of the activists, because of the politicians, but also looking through the ages and my father saying, you know, Pushkin was mixed race, Alexander Juma was black. Um, it just made me think, you know, we could do it, we could be there just in the same way. As and in that, I would hope that people would look at us as role models, yeah. um, you know, not, not you know, uh, the, the generation before, um, this, we, we're there for you. Thank you for that. So we're going to talk um, more now about activism. So for me, um, when it comes to activism, as a, as a, as a young person and as a, as a student, I always tend to look at my experiences. And because I'm, I'm the oldest in my, in my family, I always try and look at my younger brother because he's the youngest and think that if I fight and I fight for the education system to be better, then my young brother wouldn't have to go through what I went through in high school and my siblings would have a better future. So I'm looking at them, I'm thinking, how can I help um, push for change so they can have a better future in terms of my passion on when it comes to decolonizing the curriculum and having them learn about their history and also having them see proper role models. But, and I think it's very important that as um, young people, we, we um, call out the, what, um, things that are not right in, in the society that we live in because this is actually our future. And, you know, we are the ones that are going to inherit, you know, all the bad stuff that has been left behind and everything the government does wrong. We're the ones that are going to be inheriting it. So I think it's important that even with the time of social media, we should use the platforms that we have and the tools that we have to push the change. And I think that we are in more of a, for me, because I see it as when it came to the civil rights and it came to people learning about their African history and heritage, they didn't have the Internet, they didn't have Google. They had. They probably weren't even allowed to go to libraries, but they tried their best to be built, to be connected with their heritage and to be connected with their history of their ancestors and to form an identity. So as young people, we have what our grandparents and our parents didn't have. We've got all of these resources and we've got libraries and we've got the internet. We can actually actively research our history and study our history and also continue a legacy that was started by our ancestors and making sure that we are fighting for the right things and not to be too comfortable um, with the change that we have, that you know we're able to go into education, we're able to work, but just to still know that even though we're able to do that, there's still some certain parts that we're not able to do that we do need to continue to fight. So whether we're on social media and um, whether we're reading news or whether we're just reading in general, and I think it's important that we also don't let social media educate us but we also take time to look for ourselves as well. Um, and I think that 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 um, that is one thing I think I'm passionate about, just having young people understand that in everything that they do. And it doesn't have to be like you rightly said, um, Margaret, us being loud about it, but you even saying that I, after those ladies treated you like that in the cloakroom, you went in there and showed them that, you know what, no, I'm not a cloakroom lady. I am actually the speaker and this is, you gave your speech. So even just being in the room and being present in your workplaces and being present in the education system and even achieving more than they expect you to achieve, that for me, I think is a form of activism because you've shown them that, you know, I'm more than what you see me as. Um, so that even if, because I know quite a lot of people are not like us that can, you know, vocalise the problems, but just doing it in everyday lives. And I think that's very important for me when it comes to... Um, activism. So for me, when it comes to the leadership program and the cultural leader and seat of culture, I would like to see more diversity within the arts, because both of you have said how important the arts are in in the UK, but I need the arts to show the diversity that the UK have in everything that um, theatres and um, art venues produce. They need to show the diversity that we have in the UK and they need to give a platform for ethnic minorities and marginalized voices to share their stories um, and just and just commission pieces that allow um, us to have creative freedom because for me as a writer and as an artist the way that I write isn't the way that I was taught to write in schools 
and a lot of us that is passed down from like cultures, our cultures and where our parents are from, because we are naturally born storytellers and we are naturally born writers and performers because that's what we know. And the arts is so big from from like Africa and the Caribbean, like we have that, that's in us, like music and art. So for them to be able to open those doors and commission us and give us opportunities to do that creatively without gatekeeping it and showing, telling us what they want. Um, and I think it's important that our organisations want to see change, you know, because it's so much for us asking for it, but they have to be willing to see change and they have to be willing to break down that foundation of gate gatekeeping and allow um, the, our communities to come in and showcase the talent that we have and allow us to feel included in any everything when it comes to um, British um, British society. So. Um, yeah, so for me, what is the difference between being between not being racist and being actively anti-racist? So a lot of people, I think I've seen, especially on social media, will say, um, I'm not racist. But for me, it's like, to not to be racist, to actually fight for it, because you can just say, okay, I'm not a racist, it doesn't concern you. But in order for like us to all want to see change, we all have to contribute to see that change. We all have to see that, you know, this, the treatment of, especially the whole Black Lives Matter movement, the treatment of the Black community across the world is wrong. And, you know, we all need to use our voices to do that change than just sitting there and saying nothing. Like, even being silent, being silent doesn't help in situations like that. But even people, everybody just coming together to use their, um, just to use, just to unite and use some, and use the powers that we have um, and the resources that we have to fight the government and to fight the people above us to say, listen, this is how we want us, this is how we want society to be. We want everybody to be um, treated equal. Not we want everybody to be seen with with the, what they can bring to the table in terms of their merits and not their skin color. So for I'm gonna start with uh, you, Annette. What is the difference between for you not being racist and being actively anti-racist? Okay, well, I think you said a lot of it, to be honest, you know, I think, you know, being anti-racist is something you, you know, do actively, it's something you do proactively, you know, it, it's not something that you think about, it's doing things that um, are conscientiously, you know, going to be um, reduce racism or, um, or in educate people around racism. I think being, I think there's anti-racist, I think there's, um, What's it? There's anti-racist, there's racist, and there's people that are doing not doing racist things. Because I think they're three different things actually. Because I, because sometimes when you say, because yeah, because some somebody can be not anti-racist, they could be not doing anything, yeah. um, and they may they might not be a racist person, but they may be doing things that are racist. If you get me, so I think there's like yeah, because I, yeah, I've had this conversation with some people like you know, especially you know white people, and you say. Oh, Oh my gosh, you know, if you say to them that what they've done is racist, I'm not calling you a racist necessarily, you know, I might be, but I'm just saying that I think there's there's a difference between the three. Um, I think everybody, black or white, regardless of their, you know, their ethnic background, should be working towards be, being anti-racist. And I think that's something that's gained, again, as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, it's gained a lot of traction. Um, with you know black and other communities in terms of like you know people actually taking on or trying to learn more about what it means to be anti-racist and what can they do again you hear the term white allies has been you know banded about a lot and that's all good and well but it's more than just being an ally it's like you know i think you said already it's about you know physically and actively and conscientiously and continuously doing acting and doing things to reduce or to, to dismantle or deconstruct systemic racism it's not a quick fix it's something that yeah that's going to go on for generations i'm sure i'd like to think it's going to end before i die it's not um, but it's something just because that's the case doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing things actively. And I think as well and quickly, because the other thing I have a frustration I have is, yeah, honestly, yeah, I've just got to get it out somewhere in this conversation is, you know, is about, you know, how, you know, how we deconstruct or, you know, eradicate systemic racism. Yeah, some things are long term, but there's lots of things that we can do now. You know, there's I want somebody to explain to me. I haven't had a good anybody that's given me a credible argument or rationale for why in 2020 
there was there were so few black and i'm talking about black in particular i know there's other minorities but i'm talking about black people now yeah because uh, all most if not all of the indices black people seem to find themselves on the bottom yeah but why are there so few black leaders and decision makers because that's what i'm talking you know because i feel it's not the only thing we need to do bottom up we need to do it from every direction but i feel like if we haven't got people in those decision making roles and leadership roles then the power because this is where you know the power to actually influence, you know, in, you know, embed change or enact change is somewhat limited, and then we often find ourselves stuck. Yeah. So to me, I'd like, like I said, I'd like somebody to explain to me what is the rationale other than systemic racism, you know, for why there are so few black leaders in higher education, in any institution, education, you know, it doesn't matter, the church, wherever you want to talk. Yeah, because. It can't be qualified. It's not our qualifications. It's not experience. It's not a language thing. So what is it? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Annette. What do you think, um, Margaret, um, when it comes to the difference between um, not being racist and being actively anti-racist? Um, OK, um, from my perspective, non-racism is an acceptance of the status quo. So you're yeah, being non-racist, you're just saying, I'm, this whatever's happening at the moment is fine by me. I'm not going to do anything to change it. And if you're saying that it's fine by you, it means that you're accepting the, any of the inequalities that currently exist. You're accepting the fact that the opportunities are fewer. You're accepting the fact that even when there are opportunities, the door might not necessarily be opened in the same way. You're accepting the fact that there may be greater police evidence of police brutality. You're accepting the fact that there may be greater numbers of deaths in police custody of minorities. But, you know, hey, I don't need to do anything about it. And so that means that, in, in effect, accepting the status quo is tantamount to being racist. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that that's actually quite provocative. I, and, and, but what I would say to people is that... Um, being a racist doesn't mean being a member of the Ku Klux Klan um, <laughs> or a member of the British National Party. It means just actually accepting the fact that there are things that are wrong, but you're not going to do anything about it. Being anti-racist means realising that you need to be a part of the change because you recognise that it's wrong and you recognise that there are things that can be done to create positive change. Um, and so um, with that in mind, you are therefore saying to yourself, let's have a look at this, let's find out what, the, what is really wrong. And then once you actually ask yourself that really important question, then you can start, start to address the question and find some solutions. And the, the impact of that is so profound because if you ask yourself what's really wrong and you start to address things, you're addressing them pr correctly. And what I mean by that is if you ask, if you don't ask and you just say, well, we just need more black people in these, these roles, then you get a sort of tick box where lots of organisations will say, well, we've got two people here, we've got one person there and so on. Whether they're the right person or not for the job is neither here nor there. You're not going to do your homework properly as long as you get one in. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that you're getting people in to fail. You're not going to support them properly. You're not going to welcome them into the organisation. You're not going to find out how they're being treated. You're not going to bother to find out whether they're being bullied. You're not going to create systems to make sure that other people um, are sufficiently um, uh, welcoming of them to change the culture. So when I say address what is really wrong, all of those issues need to be looked at. How do we appoint people? What criteria do we use? How do we make sure we're getting the right people for the job? How do we make sure that they are suitably support, uh, supported? Um, how do we onboard them? How do we retain them? What are there um, processes for them to express difficulties without being penalized? Um, is there a, a reward structure for managers who show that they are making people feel welcome? Um, so that it becomes part of the culture. So being anti-racist means it's like being a consultant. You wouldn't, as a medical consultant, start curing something if you didn't know what it yeah. really was. So find out what's wrong and then address it. That's being anti-racist. 